Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Freddie Perez, and I am the Associate for Community Outreach at the Prowlis Resource Center of the Christopher and Anna Reed Foundation. Thank you for joining us today in our webinar, Supporting the Paralysis Community of Rural America. In November, we highlight National Rural Health Month, and as a way to bring more attention to the rural health issues and its intersection with folks living with paralysis, we invited stakeholders and service professionals from Alaska, Delaware, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming, all who work with the paralysis community. First and foremost, I would say, I would like to say that I hope you, your families, and communities are doing well during these times. Today's webinar will cover a short presentation on the free programs and services the Paralysis Resource Center offers. And we will also have an opportunity to hear from our keynote provided by Lisa Mathis, lead consultant at the Job Accommodation Network. The goal for this event is to share with fellow stakeholders that support and are involved in the world of paralysis, how the Paralysis Resource Center can help your communities. In addition, our keynote serves to provide information about how they may be of assistance as a community support. We are excited to share information and we hope that you leave this webinar with additional resources and supports that you can take back to your organizations, communities, and other networks. With that being said, let's get started. The Paralysis Resource Center at the Christopher and Anna Reed Foundation promotes the health, well-being, and independence of people living with paralysis, spinal cord injury, or other mobility impairment. We are a free, comprehensive, national source of informational support for people living with paralysis, their families, and their caregivers. Our primary goals are to foster involvement in the community, promote health, and improve the overall quality of life. I would also like to add that all of this is possible with the support of the Administration for Community Living. Since 2002, the PRC has provided resources, programs, and services that enable people living with paralysis to live independently. Christopher Reeve once said, once you choose hope, anything's possible. And today, not only is there hope for people with paralysis, but there is a path forward as well. As a base starter, in 2013, the Christopher and Anna Reed Foundation unveiled statistics on research based on the prevalence of paralysis across the United States. According to the study, there are nearly 150 Americans living with paralysis, approximately 6 million people. Of that 6 million, 1.3 million are living with a spinal cord injury. As many of you are aware, paralysis is dramatically more widespread than what, than what, once, than what was once previously thought. Each year around the world, between 250,000 to 500,000 people sustain a spinal cord injury. Now that we know what the Paralysis Resource Center is and the prevalence of paralysis, this brings me to our first area of support. Our information specialists provide customized support and answer paralysis-related questions. What's important are the following three bits of information. You can reach out to us online, via or email. Our IS team assists people as they move through the various families to date, and we offer multilingual resources that include language interpreters, phone calls, and translation services for print and web in over 170 languages. Our entire IS team is trained and certified to help anyone, from newly paralyzed individuals and their family members to persons who have lived with disabilities for quite some time, as they attempt to navigate their changing world and the services available to them. We pull from a wide array of information and expertise to devise personalized plans and approaches to getting individuals living with paralysis back into their communities and a place of well-being quickly. For more information, please visit www.christopherreeve.org slash ask. As many of you are aware, there are a number of different conditions that can cause paralysis. The slide represents many of the conditions our information specialists can assist with. Of course, while Christopher Reeve's injury put a spotlight on spinal cord injury, that is not the only condition that we serve. I will also add that the leading cause of paralysis based on our findings are stroke, followed by spinal cord injury and then multiple sclerosis. On this journey, you will have many questions undoubtedly. The PRC recognizes how important it is for families to find the answers to their questions. It can be an overwhelming time. You feel like the room is spinning. I remember when I first started the Paralysis Resource Center, staff members would tell me the story of how when Chris got injured, it felt like his whole family were transported to a whole new world. You had to go to several doctors, specialists, organizations to find answers to their questions. The Paralysis Resource Center was Dana Reeves' vision as, to, as the go-to place of support for families who had similar questions, who needed the support, and who were looking for someone to tell them that there is a future ahead of this journey. Some of these questions were regularly, some of the questions that we regularly received are, what I should be looking for in a, re, in a rehabilitation program? What are the body changes and health conditions that one should expect as they age? 
or how can I learn more about home modification? Know that there are information specialist team stands ready to assist and help answer any process related questions you have. Additionally, our information specialists can provide fact sheets that are updated regularly to include information and services on paralysis topics, as well as state and international resources. These fact sheets are critical sources of information that can further educate individuals about their health, their journey, and their new normal. Some of these topics include aging with SCI, uh, to camps for people living with disabilities, to playground accessibility, public transportation, and so on. We also have Spanish resources as well. I invite you all to visit our fact sheets page, which can be found at www.christopherreed.org. Another example of how our IS team would be able to offer support is through our free materials and resources. Yes, free. The Paralysis Research Center is known for its many educational materials and publications. Our goal is to keep individuals, families, and professionals well informed on topics that are important to the paralysis community. Of course, when we think about these materials, we think of the Paralysis Resource Guide, a general guidebook for living a healthy, active, and independent life. However, this is only one of many resources available to our community. We have our wallet cards, which allows folks to carry critical information on their person regarding autonomic dysreflexia, deep vein thrombosis, and sepsis. These handy wallet cards can provide life-saving information those staffing EMT units, emergency rooms, and other health centers need to best treat you. There are a variety of topics that we have publications on, including pain management, women's mental health after paralysis, and parenting with paralysis, to name a few. I would also like to add that these publications, wallet cards, and books are available for free. If you're interested in receiving them, please reach out to me or our information specialist team, and we can have them shipped to you. I would like to read this quote from Mylene. Even after 20 years of living with a spinal cord injury, I still have questions that my primary or rehabilitation doctor cannot answer. I use the ReFoundation website and forum for answers. I have also called the information specialist on various occasions. I want to note that Mylene has been coming to the PRC for 20 years now and is a prime example of how no matter where you are in your journey, the PRC can help. Individuals living with paralysis can feel overwhelmed and sometimes alone. Reef peer mentors provide support, emotional as well as resourceful, to members of their community, their families, and caregivers. People who have unique experiences and have the done this, done that sort of stories that can help people's adjustment to their new normal. We match people with similar levels of paralysis and or experiences. We offer caregiver, caregiver mentoring too. Peer mentors are certified and trained, and currently we have over 440 certified peer mentors who are living with paralysis. To learn more about our peer family support program, visit www.christopherreeve.org slash peer. On this journey, our community can help with practical experience. These are some of the most common questions we hear from our community who are seeking advice from our peer mentors. Who did you use in your town for home notification services? What were your experiences when hiring a personal care assistant? And have you ever tried the local public transportation? Is it accessible? The program allows for very little to high amounts of communication. People can choose to meet in whatever platform is most comfortable to them. And if there's only one question they need help with, we can take care of that as well. Here we have Brooke and Ashley. Prior to having a mentor, I had a difficult time expressing my feelings to my family and friends. They could not fully understand the grief that I was feeling after my accident. Ashley is able to relate to me in certain ways my family and friends just couldn't. Ashley knows how to encourage me, which makes me accepting life with paralysis and learning to move forward much easier. When Brooke was injured, she reached out to the Parent Family Support Program and was paired with Ashley and have been friends for over two years now. Ashley has been an important support to Brooke as she goes through living with paralysis. If your communities are seeking similar support, please feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with the program manager. The Quality of Life Grants Program strives to empower individuals with paralysis and their families. We provide grants to nonprofit organizations that improve quality of life through inclusion, access, independence, opportunities for community engagement, and other life-enhancing endeavors for people with paralysis. In addition, to date, we have funded over 3,000 programs nationwide, awarding over $28 million. In my next slide, I will briefly discuss the different grants we have available. You can find more detail online at www.christopherreed.org slash QOL. Mm -hmm. 
I have been fortunate enough to witness some great projects funded in this last year. Most recently, having the opportunity to see the real world impact an accessible playground can have for children and what that means for the development and inclusion within society. I have witnessed the difference it makes having a wheelchair accessible van that can transport patients to and from their rehabilitation appointments. The, important of the importance of community centers and camps to be inclusive and accessible. The creation of a disaster preparedness program for an independent living center in Puerto Rico. These are just some of the many examples of programmatic efforts we have funded in the past. In this slide, you will see we have four types of grants. The first one being direct effect, an open focus grant of up to $25,000 to support the wide range of projects and activities. This is offered twice a year in the spring and the fall. We also have our other grants, high impact, expansion effect, and lastly, we have our high impact innovative assistive technology grants. To find more information, again, I encourage you all to visit www.christopherree.org slash QOL. On this journey, grants for nonprofits exist to address the needs of people living with paralysis in their communities. Some questions we've been asked from, these, from those interested in applying include the following. Who can apply for a quality of life grant? What are the different types of grants available? What are some project examples that quality of life grant programs has funded in previous years? I hope that the information shared across these slides have given you a better understanding of our quality of life grants program. And a reminder that we welcome and accept 501c3 nonprofit organizations, municipal and state governments, school districts, recognized tribal entities, and other institutions such as a community and veterans hospital. Meet Edna. Edna utilized the PRC and the PRG to educate her on what to expect while living with paralysis. Once home, Edna found herself retaining, um, retraining the caregivers herself, teaching them to cook, do laundry, and different ways to bathe and transfer her. She realized there was a gap in training in Ohio where, where hands-on training for home, home, home health aides was not required. She applied for a quality of life grant, which helped her establish the Compassion Training and Awareness Center, which focused on proper caregiver training. She has received a total of three grants and trained over 600 caregivers. Most recently, the Compassion Center has moved into a new location with the functional kitchen, living room, bathroom, designed for training. Our Military and Veteran Initiative. Our Military and Veteran Initiative supports all military service members, no matter what era they served in. Injury does not need to be combat related. We focus on providing tailored information and referral services that will help guide service members through the military and veterans healthcare systems. We also do outreach to military veter uh, treatment facilities and VA medical centers, and we strive to connect service men women and their families with a parent family support program for an added layer of support. In addition, 46% of our quality of life grant recipients reported that their projects serve military or veterans with paralysis. For more information, please visit our website, www.christopherreeve.org. Advocacy and education. The Paralysis Resource Center also works to build education around self-advocacy efforts. We work on educating policymakers on paralysis related issues. We participate in coalitions and work to improve public policy. The policy team works to build grassroots support and engagement and through our Advocate for Change program, you can lend your voice to the Reef Foundation and make a difference for people living with paralysis, their families and caregivers. Most recently, we have worked to advocate for a better understanding of COVID-19 and its impact on people living with paralysis, advocating for the rights of disabled travelers, employment rights, and work to preserve, protect and improve issues around accessibility and civil rights among more. Combat isolation and foster peer connections, we have interactive space for families impacted by paralysis to share their thoughts, ask questions, and view educational content. We have educational videos on our YouTube channel where you can find videos that cover dental care, adaptive tools for independence, employment, among more. We often have webinars and Facebook live sessions. Our social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are updated regularly to showcase upcoming events and other important dates. We have paralysis-related blogs, which cover stories from our community and staff, and updates on the PRC. We have a section on COVID-19, relationships, and more. And lastly, our online community, Reef Connect. Our resource map is a great tool to identify resources in your community. Visit our homepage and you will find the resource map titled Resource in Your Area. You can then type in your zip code and it will populate based off that zip code. The resources are available are relevant to the needs of the paralysis community and will also highlight organizations who have been recipients of our quality of life grants and those who have applied as well. 
Lastly, ReefConnect. Our online community, ReefConnect, is a platform for people to use to discuss a variety of topics. As you can see in this slide, we have some forums underway with the focus on the new normal, newly paralyzed, health and wellness, and relationships. We also have a group in Spanish that regularly interact. To sign up, please visit community.christopherreeve.org. I would like to finish off by saying this. A hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to persevere and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Here at the Paralysis Resource Center, we stand ready to assist your communities in any way we can. I encourage you all to visit our website, christopherreeve.org, to learn more about the Paralysis Resource Center and to discover additional items that we have to offer. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote presentation for this afternoon. Using Jan as part of your accommodation toolbox in America by Lisa Mathis. Lisa joined the Motor team as a consultant in February 2011. Lisa provides one-on-one -on -one guidance on workplace accommodations and the Americans with Disabilities Act. She assists employees and employers with understanding their rights and their responsibilities under the ADA and in identifying accommodation solutions for employees with motor impairments. Lisa also presents on the ADA and accommodation issues at various national conferences and provides specialized training to gen audiences and advocacy groups. Lisa graduated from West Virginia University with a bachelor's degree in business and a master of arts in communication studies. Welcome Lisa and I will be, I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thank you. Let me get this back up, switch that. Okay, let's go. So thank you for the introduction. My name's Lisa, thanks for joining me this afternoon. So just to give you all an idea of the topics we're gonna to be covering today, I am gonna explain what we do at the Job Accommodation Network or JAN as many people call us, just in case anyone's unfamiliar with our services. Um, I'm hoping some of you are familiar. Then I do quickly want to touch on ADA basics, just so we're all on the same page of what an employer has to do uh, versus a person with a disability is entitled to under the ADA, and then get into the interactive process and look how service providers could play a role. Uh, then we'll take a closer look at some accommodation examples, some situation and solutions, and then of course, I'll answer any questions y'all have for me at the end of the presentation. So what do we do at JAN? Consultants at JAN specialize in answering questions about the federal laws that apply to disability rights. Mainly, this is gonna be Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, but we'll also talk to federal sector for Rehab Act. Uh, we try to help our customers resolve accommodation issues that come up with and implement uh, successful accommodations. We work with our clients to try to identify possible solutions that can enable people with disabilities or limitations to successfully perform their roles. We talk a wide range of medical conditions in any career and try to provide ideas that can be tailored to the specific need or limitation or environment. So whenever you call us, we really don't care if someone truly has an ADA defined disability, that's a broad definition we'll get into, but we really just wanna focus on what are the limitations they're having? What are the job tasks they're trying to perform? How can we help overcome those issues? Jan has aided Fortune 500 companies with ADA compliance issues, down to mom and pop shops looking to modify a product that probably don't even have enough employees to uh, be covered by ADA as an employer. So it's safe to say we help all customers in all industries and categories. Best part of JAN has to be that we're a free service. We are funded by the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. We're also confidential. So what we discuss between us stays between us. The frontline uh, program assistants will ask your name and the state you're calling from and the disability involved. And that is truly in-house, confidential. And that's just so we can pick up where we left off if you have an ongoing accommodation issue. We're a national service, so although the only JAN office is based here in West Virginia, we do take calls from all over the country and U.S. territories. And um, we do all of our services remote. We did this pre-COVID, so um, we do all our consulting electronically. So phone, email, chat, website, and we're available on social media as well. 
So we talk to employers, we talk to the individual with a disability and employees, uh, to service providers, to friends and family members. But I will say the biggest portion of our customers are coming from those employers and employees with disabilities. We have an extensive website on askjan.org. <clears throat> there you're going to find the running list of A to Z lists with these five subsections. Um, so depending on what information you have as a service provider, that's going to help you um, kind of navigate a possible accommodation solutions. So if you know the disability or you just know the work related function that's being problematic, you can go to those different A to Z pages and get information tailored to that information. Um, the by topic page has various topics such as legal resources or parking and leave general uh, topics. And then the accommodation tab has definitions for each type of accommodation. Some have longer publications linked in there. So that's where I would encourage all users to start is the A to Z page on the askjan.org site. We also develop these practical guidances for both individual and employer. It's a summary of common issues that people have when requesting accommodations, and it explains and goes over how to address those appropriately. Again, on the website, multiple resources for even more info on the ADA and REAB Acts, uh, comprehensive publications, EEOC contact information if someone does have to file a claim, sample policies on the page, and then interactive process that we're going to uh, dive in today. But we do have three versions of that, one for the federal sector, one for private, and then one for service providers that we're going to delve into today. We can be pretty busy here at JAN. So even though we're a small office of less than 30 people, last year we had over 50,000 contacts of people calling and emailing and submitting questions on our Ask JAN, uh, JAN on Demand feature. Over 18 million people have visited our website. So a lot of times whenever I was still traveling and going to conferences, they didn't even know that they could get live consultation help. They just thought we were a database, you know, plugging into this web page. So lots of people only use the web page, which is fine. But if if there's ever anything um, not on the web page that you're looking for, don't hesitate to reach out and have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with someone. We have a quarterly newsletter so people can keep up with the different accommodation topics or new changes in ADA. And we do offer our services in Spanish as well. You can view our website in Spanish or you can give us a call and we do have a Spanish consultant on staff. Another large portion of our job is to refer people to the appropriate channel to further assist them. This can be a referral to vendors, which could be uh, makers for products or technologies that we may recommend as an accommodation, may refer people to an enforcing agency if they want to file a claim. Uh, disability groups, we have working relationships with various groups where they refer clients to us for accommodation help or vice versa. State programs, great resource, resource such as the state assistive technology program. Uh, if someone wants to play with some technology or demo a product, that's where I'll suggest they uh, contact first because they let people borrow and see if that's really the accommodation um, that they need in the workplace before an employer makes that investment. Of course, we love our state voc rehab agencies, good for job seekers and training. Um, and also they have like a wealth of local resources. So if someone's calling me from California um, with a unique situation, I might just suggest they run it by the voc rehab and see if there's you know any local on the ground resources that that California VR knows about that I don't. So we were established in 83 as a free service been at this for over 30 years so we have four teams the motor team which I take lead on so I'm doing with paralysis you know hip impairments cumulative trauma disorders arthritis um, then, of course, the sensory team, which is the hearing, the vision issues, respiratory and allergy issues, the cognitive neurological team, the mental health impairments, behavioral health, um, learning disabilities or even addiction issues. And then lastly, that small entrepreneurship team that um, those consultants really help people that want to start their own business kind of get that funding, build it from the ground up, develop a business plan. Um, and get the necessary resources for that to get that small business off the ground. I did want to highlight a newish feature to the website, the JAN Workplace Accommodation Toolkit. 
It's a free toolkit that provides employers and service providers, <clears throat> excuse me, the tools needed to create a more disability inclusive and compliant workplace. So this toolkit is going to have the best in emerging practices and providing accommodations in the workplace. There's going to be three drawers with information depending on what role you're in. So the first drawer is going to be for the recruiters, managers, supervisors. Second drawer is geared towards the accommodation experts and consultants um, and subject matter experts. And then lastly, there is a drawer for the employee with a disability and coworkers and friends and families. So that's more of the supportive roles. So at JAN, we do have a process that we use and recommend using to assist with the interactive process. It involves these questions to work through based on the individual situation. So first, what are the limitations involved? This is going to vary with any disability or medical condition, but we find that breaking down what the condition, um, what the specific limitations are can be more beneficial than focusing on the diagnosis, like I said. Two people with the same diagnosis can be impacted in a very different way. So making sure that the focus is on the specific individual needs. Next, how are these limitations affecting the per employee's job performance? Are they having difficulty getting to work on time due to difficulties with sleep, falling behind on deadlines due to concentration issues? Are there specific tasks that are problematic? Does an employee who had difficulty walking long distances regularly need to use the printer on the other side of the office to do their job? So like I said, focus on those uh, job tasks. Any of that information that you can gather can assist with looking at what accommodations are available to reduce or eliminate the problems. It can also be important to look at if all possible resources are being used when you're determining effective options. Okay, so moving on to ADA basics, just want to get everyone on the same uh, page here and really remind people of the general principles of ADA and accommodations. So Title I of the ADA requires an employer to provide accommodations to qualified individuals with disabilities who are employees or applicants for employment, unless doing so would cause an undue hardship to the employer. So in general, an accommodation is any change in the work environment or the way things are customarily done that enables an individual with a disability to enjoy equal employment opportunities, whether that's the application or review stage, the performance of essential functions, or to partake in equal benefits or privileges. So when I get a call from a person with disability asking what their employer has to do as far as accommodations, I always explain it's easier to talk about the things that employers don't have to do. It's a shorter list. Again, keep in mind that employers are allowed to do these things, but they aren't required to do them. So you don't have to remove essential job functions. Those are going to be the primary fundamental duties of the role. So if someone can't do those essential functions, um, and they can't do them even with accommodations, and the employee isn't qualified for that job because the employer doesn't have to remove them as an accommodation. But if that's the case, an employer should be looking at reassignment to a job that they can do with or without accommodations. So speaking of reassigning, um, employers don't have to create new jobs or bump other employees from their jobs to create a vacancy for the person with a disability. So reassignment is for current vacancies or soon to be vacancies. Employers also don't have to lower production standards, whether they're qualitative or quantitative, as long as they're uniformly applied to those with and without disabilities, that's fine. But an employer may have to accommodate someone with a disability to bring them up to meet those performance standards that they have in place. Uh, they don't have to provide personal use items that are needed on and off the job. Usually that's the wheelchairs, the hearing aids and medication and prosthetics. And then finally, employers don't have to provide any accommodation that poses an undue hardship to the employer. This means that if an accommodation requires significant difficulty or expense to provide, then it may trickle down to an undue hardship. So looking at the interactive process now, really that means employer and a person with a disability working together. But the service providers can assist in that process. So, so the interactive process should be an open dialogue about disability limitations and the job task that we're trying to accommodate. So who's assisting the individual? 
really anyone can be active in this process. Here I have listed many of the service providers we see that play an integral part of the accommodation process. Like I mentioned, the interactive process isn't required, but rather it's recommended. So with that being said, there isn't a universal interactive process. This is a sample we've developed at JAN. Some employers have their own process, which is great. Some don't. So this can give them a streamlined process that can make it better for all involved. We have a six step process that hopefully leads to a successful accommodation. As we go through these steps today, we'll look at real life examples to illustrate each step. So let's get into it. So making an accommodation request. Typically an accommodation request is gonna be made by the person with a disability. They're probably gonna be the ones to realize there's a workplace barrier that's preventing them from performing their job or even applying for the job. There may be times that others uh, may request on behalf of the individual. So employers aren't required to use, employees aren't required to use special ADA language or terminology, but at Jan, we're gonna recommend everyone use ADA terminology to really um, spark that request. But um, in its simplest terms, you simply have to let your employer know that you need a change at work because of a medical condition. This should prompt the employer to move forward with the request. So how can service providers help? Make sure clients are aware of their rights under the ADA. Again, an employer needs to consider accommodations absent hardship. So a lot of times individuals aren't going to realize that there's this federal law that would furnish them these accommodations. You want to document the request. Although not required, putting a request in writing can be good. Create that paper trail in case there's a dispute whether you requested something and when you requested something. And you want to be clear and specific. Service providers or the individual can describe, describe specific needs and offer suggestions for accommodations. And like I said, although it's not required, use the terms reasonable accommodation, use the term ADA and kind of spark that request. So first example for step one, making that request, an employee has been out of work for six months with a worker's comp injury. The employee's doctor sends a letter stating the employee is released to return to work, but with some restrictions. Did we make a request? Yes, with the note, we understand she's gonna need accommodations to overcome those restrictions. And, as, and we know this is related to a medical condition since it was initially in a worker's comp issue. So providing information, step two. Once that request has been received, an employer may ask relevant questions that's gonna enable them to make an informed decision. Sometimes the disability and accommodation are obvious and so no more information is needed. In some situations, the employer may need documentation of the disability and need for accommodation. So to provide effective accommodations, employers are gonna to need to know what limitations are interfering with job performance, what specific work tasks are an issue. So if additional information is needed, that's where service providers can get involved. Help explain the individual's functional limitations and need for accommodation. A VA counselor, VR counselor, may have some insight to what an employee needs to better perform a task. So some tips, describe the limitation and the problem. Get information from the individual when possible. Individuals with disabilities, they're often, you know, the best source of information. They're familiar with their limitations. Oftentimes in a previous job, they've kind of had to overcome these issues. They know what they need, but they might be scared to bring it up on their own accord. So, you know, service providers can encourage that open dialogue. And then, like I said, use ADA language. When providing documentation, service providers may want to use the ADA specific language so the information will be helpful for employers. I wanted to show you guys two of the most popular publications on the JAN site. The left is going to be the employee's practical guide to requesting and negotiating accommodations. This really lays out the employer obligations versus the individual's entitlements and explains the ADA in an easy to understand manner. And then the right is the practical guidance for medical professionals to help patients write accommodation letters. This is like the old Mad Libs where you just plug in the patient's name, plug in the limitations, and the requested accommodation information. And it has the template in paragraph format, so it makes it super simple to accompany those initial requests. Both of these are linked on the AskJan website.
And then I also have employer resources. Um, so sometimes employers really don't have their own universal company forms to elicit medical information. So if the disability and the need for accommodation is not obvious, that's when an employer can require that the employee get medical documentation to show, yes, I have an ADA disability and I need this requested accommodation. So the medical inquiry form on the right um, in response to an accommodation request, you know, educate your clients that, hey, there's these forms available to kind of expedite the process. And then on the left, you'll see the employer's practical guide. It's similar to the employee's guide, but it kind of breaks out down in more detail what an employer may have to do absent undue hardship. Okay, so an example for providing information in step two. In response to a poor performance evaluation, a teacher gave a doctor's note claiming her MS is contributing to performance problems and says she may benefit from an accommodation. Did we provide all the information? No, we didn't. We know that an employee needs an accommodation due to a condition, but we don't know what the limitations are, what the specific problem is. We have no idea what specific limitations are causing the performance problems. There can be a number of different things that can contribute to poor performance. So we gave the general accommodation request, but we should have given more info to show what type of accommodation I need, what's gonna be useful for me. Step three, exploring accommodation options. So once you've identified the individual um, individual's limitation that's causing a problem and identified what the problem is, then the employer is ready to explore various options. Employers should be open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. So when exploring accommodation options, a service provider such as an ergonomist may do a job analysis, which could include an ergonomic eval to assess the work environment and define any potential problems. Some service providers may be able to provide feedback to determine what assistive technology options may be deemed appropriate as an accommodation. So here you wanna keep an open mind. This is gonna be the time to brainstorm and consider what may work for the person. Again, invite the individual to suggest accommodations. They may have some good accommodation ideas but may be hesitant to bring them up without being prompted. It, People are nervous to talk to their employer. HR can be intimidating. So as a service provider, encourage that communication again. And don't be scared to consult with other service providers. Many instances, it may be necessary for a team of service providers to work together to develop an effective accommodation strategy. And then of course, use JAN when needed. We're a free national resource for individuals, employers, service providers, anybody who, are, who is seeking help to come up with accommodation ideas. Example to illustrate step three, we have a social worker with use of only one hand who has requested a work-related assistant to do all her keyboarding for case notes for her. So sometimes work-related aids or assistance are appropriate and sometimes they're not. Just because this is the accommodation that was requested doesn't mean it's the accommodation employer must provide. An employer has the right to explore other effective options. So how can we figure out what else might work? This is going to be a good time to call Jan. It's our job to help develop alternative accommodation ideas, and this often requires thinking outside that box. So in this specific example, we suggested the employee use a combination of speech recognition software for longer case notes and a one-handed keyboard and a foot pedal for the shorter typing tasks. What if Jan isn't available? One of the major benefits of the new uh, website redesign is that we made our more commonly used features easier to access. One of those features was those A to Z lists of disabilities and accommodations that I went over. Like I said, it breaks it down into disability by limitation, work-related function, topic, or accommodation based on what information you already have. And I've put the red box um, around the A to Z list. It's at the top center of the Ask Jan website. So choosing an accommodation. Once options have been explored, the employer gets to choose what accommodation to implement. If there's more than one option, the employer should consider the preference of the employee, but it's not required to do so. Ultimately, the employer gets to choose among effective options. 
when an individual feels strongly about a certain accommodation, service providers may be able to help the individual develop ideas to try and convince the employer to choose that preferred accommodation. These ideas should focus on how the accommodation will benefit both the individual and the employer by overcoming limitations and making the individual more productive. You want to sell it. So if the employer is still hesitant, service providers may be able to suggest a trial period or a temporary accommodation to really showcase that it's a good idea. Um, some tips service providers can help in this example. You want to let the client know that employers have the right to choose among effective options. A lot of times individuals call us and they're like, they have to do this. This is what my doctor put. Well, that's not the case under ADA. So service providers kind of educating their clients. Yeah, at the end of the day, an employer can choose among effective options. And then you want to justify preferences. If the client feels strongly, like I said, help them develop a case and a list of reason why the preferred accommodation is the best accommodation. Here we have a customer service rep with diabetes, happened to have strong body odor that they couldn't reduce until we got the diabetes under control. His employer was considering putting up a cubicle wall and an air purifier in his work area. His job could be done from home, but the employer was concerned about isolating the employee. Okay, so I do tell employers they want to be mindful of dignity issues when choosing among effective options, and you don't want to force isolation. You don't want to segregate people, you know, with disabilities. But again, you want to be mindful of dignity issues. Are cube walls and an air purifier going to draw attention to this guy with diabetes? Something to think about. So how can we help the employer choose? Like I said, talk with the individual. They often know what will work and what they need from the start. The employee said, I like the idea of telework. The cube wall draws negative attention, in my opinion, and he expressed his preference. Now we're looking at implementing the accommodation. So we chose it, so now we have to implement. Service providers can help train the individual how to use assistive device or software. When equipment is involved, service providers can help properly install and um, train the person on how to use it. In some cases, an individual may need continued support while adjusting to an accommodation, and a service provider, such as a job coach, can assist during that stage. Service providers can also provide feedback on the effectiveness of the accommodation once it's in place. So you want to offer assistance, assistance during the implementation of the accommodation. Um, service providers can set up and train on equipment and devices and provide support to the individual who may need help adjusting. And you want to make sure to involve the individual throughout the implementation of the accommodation. You want to communicate with the client while implementing the accommodation to help ensure success for all parties involved. A secretary with a voice disorder had difficulty speaking for long periods of time. Her employer purchased a text-to-speech communication device with phone connectivity. So the employer got a text-to-speech device. How can the service provider help with implementation? Does it need customized? Are there instructions? Is there integration with the company phone or computer software? These are all things to consider. And then lastly, monitoring the accommodation. It's often forgotten part of the interactive process um, after they're in place. So in some cases, an accommodation stops being effective for various reasons. Sometimes a person's limitations change, the workplace itself changes, the job changes, or the accommodation starts to become an undue hardship for the employer. So because changes occur, employers may need to revisit accommodations. So once it stops, um, working, service providers may be able to provide additional assistance or suggestions for alternatives. Service providers can assist when equipment or technology needs routine maintenance or updating. Sometimes Hey, Lisa, it looks like your audio is off. <clears throat> OK, 
Can you hear me? Sounds good. Yep, you're back. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa, we can't hear you again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay. The light needs to be solid for it to work. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. No so the tips for monitoring, you wanna leave the individual in good hands. Um, make sure the individual can troubleshoot basic problems with equipment or devices and know who to contact when they're not functioning properly and encourage ongoing communication. For any workplace issue, ongoing communication is gonna be the key to success. The same is true for accommodations. Individuals should be encouraged to communicate any issues they have with their accommodations. Here we have an auditor with progressive vision loss from macular degeneration started using screen reading software a year ago. Recently, the employer purchased new database software only to find out that the employee's screen reading software wouldn't work with the new database. How could the employer have avoided this problem? We could have avoided this problem. When the employer decides to upgrade or buy new equipment and products, you want to take a look at current accommodations in place. Employees may need to explain how their current accommodation will now need to be modified to align with the new equipment or products. Um, so those accessibility issues may need to be addressed. And again, so a service provider educating their clients to advocate for themselves in these instances is going to be beneficial for everybody. So here, if you go to the publications and articles tab on the homepage, you're going to find this interactive process for service providers. And I really just wanted to highlight how you guys can act as, um, as service providers can aid in these interactive processes that's hopefully occurring between the employee and the medical with an employee with a medical issue and their employer. Y'all are the vital part of determining those restrictions and limitations and really weighing in on the functional limitations, providing that information on the supporting medical documentation. You guys are often a liaison between the employee and employer, so you guys can facilitate that communication, which we encourage, keeping everybody on the same page and informed. You guys are often in a better position to inform clients of their rights under the ADA and other laws. And of course, you guys often know of the best resources to connect to and how to gather relevant information. Employers often don't know what's available or where to turn. And it's evident since you guys are with us today that you hopefully already or will now utilize the job accommodation network when you need additional help or tailored accommodation ideas. So now we want to get into some accommodation ideas for various limitations stemming from various medical conditions or disabilities. Um, these limitations can stem from disabilities from birth or they could be acquired injuries and illnesses. So looking at um, acquiring or modifying equipment absent hardship. This accommodation is pretty clear cut for most employers, but sometimes, like I said, it's hard for them to keep up with on products that are available um, or what's out there. So the first example we have um, an HR rep called us looking for ways to accommodate an employee. They were originally a respiratory therapist, but since having a stroke, they now have hand tremors. So doing certain medical procedures is hard for them. So the company is looking at reassignment to a new role, one in the sleep lab, but was concerned about an employee's ability to perform computer tasks. Jane referred the employee, employer to multiple vendors for mouse adapters. There are tremor limiting mice on the market and large button keyboards with key guards that keep fingers on the top of the button you're trying to strike. We also pushed out a vendor list for speech recognition, recognition software. Again, we don't recommend or um, enforce, endorse any one product, but we just provide information on the products that we know exist and let you as the callers make those determinations. Now we have a broker who wasn't meeting production standards because they had a hard time typing due to finger numbness. The accommodation here was after speaking with a JAN consultant, the employer did end up providing word prediction software for the time being, but now better understood speech recognition software for the future use if need be.
Okay, so um, now that we've given you the rundown on some assistive technology options that are out there and some considerations, how do I know what to get? I mentioned talk to the employee. They often know what they need. Another suggestion is going to be make IT your friend. They're good with tech and can bridge that compatibility gap with company databases and systems. And then again, specialists, either healthcare or technology specialists, you know, communicate with them, ask them questions, um, see if they've dealt with this in the past. Like I'm sure other employees have called them like with work related issues. How did we overcome this? They might have, you know, a wealth of knowledge. And then of course, calling Jan. So I mentioned state assistive technology projects earlier. Each state does have one for the demonstration. This provides opportunities for people to become familiar familiar with specific types of AT by comparing and contrasting the functions and features of devices through hands-on exploration. They have device loan options. You can borrow AT for a limited time to try it out and determine is it feasible in your work environment before a purchase is made. Uh, Reutilization. Financing. These are the low cost or no cost loans made available to people with disabilities to help alleviate the financial burden some of these products may cause. So even more assistive technology information, agribility, that's going to be for farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural workers with disabilities. They have lots of information on different products for the outdoor type jobs. Of course, AT uh, conferences. I know I personally always go to ATIA down in Orlando and then um, CSUN, which moved to Anaheim, California past couple of years. And then CAP, the Computer and Electronics Accommodations Program. They can help Department of Defense employees what they need in the workplace. They furnish that assistive technology. The Helen Keller National Center provides training and resources exclusively to people of 16 and over who have combined vision and hearing loss. Again, state AT projects. And then I love the RESNA program, the Rehab Engineers of North America for custom uh, product jobs, equipment ideas, and they provide tailored products. I've seen them at conferences, uh, really kind of make some unique workstations for people in wheelchairs specifically. So another type of accommodations making the workplace accessible. Employers need to make sure that all employees are able to get in and out of the workplace, use common areas such as restrooms, exercise rooms, and break rooms. You always think of a wheelchair ramp into an entrance when you think of worksite accessibility, but something people don't really consider is the air quality. So lots of us have fragrance sensitivities and allergies, and we need access to those areas as well. So we want to be mindful of the accessibility. It's really fully encompassing to all people of limitations. Here we had a college uh, professor had leg weakness, therefore had trouble walking long distances. The accommodation here is the employer assigned the employee to a dedicated building so she wasn't trekking all over campus, and the employer also installed installed handrails throughout that one building to help the individual walk. Now we have a new hire, happened to be on a wheelchair, and noticed that the break room had three steps leading down into it. The new hire mentioned it to the employer, so the employer ended up calling us to learn what next steps should be. Here, Jan explained accessibility rules for employees under Title I, and they ended up moving that break room for all employees and lowered the microwave and soap dispensers. This created a more inclusive workplace and was effective for the individual. The employer did report spending a one-time cost of 500, which increased diversity and retained a valued employee. The next type of accommodation required by ADA is job restructuring. Uh, when it comes to job restructuring, it could mean a couple things. Oftentimes, it's removing or reallocating those marginal tasks, which are the secondary duties of a role, or it could be changing how or when functions are performed. Uh, one important thing employers should do is sort out what functions are considered marginal and what functions are considered marginal. 
So looking at job restructuring example, we have a secretary who had weakness and pain in her hands, so she couldn't lift the packages that were being delivered. And the accommodation, the employer assigned another worker to catch those deliveries and get them where they need to be. This enabled the secretary to still be productive, so she wasn't working in pain from any lifting. Now we have a custodian who worked at a county government. He had balance and gate issues. So he had a hard time doing his job of general building maintenance, including emptying the trash, sweeping, and working on the grounds outside. So the employer permitted him to use a motorized cart to carry trash bins, and he was able to use a riding floor polisher so he could just sit in the seat and the balance issues weren't as prevalent then. Another basic accommodation has to do with modifying schedules or allowing leave time. We get a lot of questions about how much leave an employer have to provide. There's not a definite time frame under the ADA. It's going to be that case by case determination. So we can help people with this type of accommodation by discussing options and undue hardship issues, suggesting uh, alternatives to leave in some instances, and then providing basic information about related laws, which oftentimes is the workers' comp and then the Family Medical Leave Act. So here's a typical example of modifying schedules. An employee who works in a call center has gastrointestinal disorder, has to take frequent restroom breaks. Productivity is measured by the number of calls taken. He asked that his employer allow him to take all the breaks he needed and exempt him from meeting that productivity standard. Like I said earlier, we don't have to lower production standards as an accommodation. So the employer denied this request, but does contact Jan to see if there's other options. Jan was able to give the employer some ideas that the employer was able to use. Here, they continued to require the employee meet productivity standards, but moved them closer to the restroom and allowed him to have flexible breaks and to make up the time for any breaks taken beyond what employee, all employees are entitled to. So with these accommodations in place, they were able to meet the production standard. I included this example because it illustrates a typical accommodation related to scheduling, but also demonstrates an important requirement of the ADA. Just because an employer can't provide the accommodation the employee requests doesn't mean that's the end of the employer's obligation. Like the employer in the example, employers should enter into this interactive process and work with the employee and outside resources such as Jan to come up with other accommodation options. Otherwise, the employer may be guilty of failing to provide an accommodation under ADA. Moving on, we have a construction worker who had um, depression stemming from another underlying medical condition. So the employer permitted ADA leave while the worker got treatment. Then once he was clear to return to work, he was given a reduced schedule to slowly transition back to full-time status. Now we have an office manager with a rare disorder plus depression. She was slacking at work with her deadlines. She couldn't stay focused and struggled with her assignments. So she brought it up with the supervisor um, which was a good tactic as you don't want to wait before it's too late to ask for accommodations. They discussed the issues and the employer gave the employee time to call her support people. In this case, it was friends and family, but sometimes that may look like calling a therapist or counselor. So with this employee calling her friends and family during her periodic breaks, this helped her regroup and in turn increase productivity. Okay, so now we have a concierge at a resort, must have been out on leave, and now wants to return to work, but limited hours to start off and to use a cane. So after talking to the employer, Jan suggested use of a stool to help with those walking issues, extra breaks when needed, and then also a modified schedule. We also went over removing non-essential functions, so he was focused his time and energy on essential functions with the hours he was working. And then we did explain the basic premise of FMLA. I want to briefly mention that reassignment is an accommodation under ADA, but it is considered the accommodation of last resort. 
This means that employers are expected to try to accommodate in the current job unless both the employer and the employee agree jumping to a vacant reassignment is the most effective option. Our example is an employee with a spinal cord injury who utilized public transportation to get to work. Then that bus route changed and was a big problem for this employee. So the employer ended up calling Jan for their commute obligations and accommodation ideas. After learning that yes, while an employer doesn't physically trans have to transport employees to work unless they do so for all employees, an employer may have to change the location of work when the employee can't commute due to a disability. So here the employer assigned the employee to another work site that was along a bus route that was effective for the individual. Okay, so that wraps up situation and solutions. This is the home page. I did put a yellow circle around the newly added um, Corona page. Um, everything will be linked there and updated. You'll also see the popular A to Z listing, like I mentioned, uh, the ADA libraries up there, the publications and training page. And then this is also how you get to the live chat feature on the website, which people like. We are still teleworking here at Jan, so we're changing the way we talk to clients. You can definitely still call us at the 800 number, but the quickest way to get in touch with a consultant is going to be the live chat feature or to email us at jan at askjan.org. But if you prefer to speak on the phone, call the 800 number and leave a message and someone will definitely call you back. So I'm going to leave our contact information up here for a moment and see if I can... Oops, I'm just kidding. see if there is any questions in the chat or mm -hmm. does anybody have any questions everyone just a reminder if you do have any questions please feel free to use the question and answers box feature um we'll give it about a minute or two one has any questions lisa thank you for that presentation hey thanks for having me today And while we wait to see if more questions um, or if any questions come up, yeah, you want to um, remind everyone that um, you know you can you this video will be available. The webinar is being recorded, and so the video will be available on the um, Christopher and Anna Reeve Foundation's YouTube channel. Um, that should probably be up by the end of this week. We encourage all of you who attended to please share with your networks um, to anybody who else who may want to learn about. Um, the Job Accommodation Network and also the Paralysis Resource Center, um, and as well as those who, you know, coworkers who may not have been able to attend today, please share with them as well. Um, again, the purpose of this event was to have um, a little explanation about what the Paralysis Resource Center is all about, and also to have a support, um, a community support, such as the Job Accommodation Network. So um, all these different stakeholders, um, service providers that are um, in today's webinar are able to um, you know use them in 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 their own professional uh, capacity as well okay so it looks like we're not going to have any questions which is totally fine you can always oh, I, there's one in the q a pod um uh, who can utilize jan and at what cost because they missed the beginning part there so anyone can contact us uh we talk our biggest portion is employers and employees with disabilities but we also talk to service providers friends and family members um, we really talk to anyone and it is for free so we're funded by the department of labor's office of disability employment policy so we are a free service each and every time you call us for information on Title I of the ADA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Doris, thank you for your comments. Lots of new information. And again, that's our, our, our goal to provide new information um, to folks attending this webinar. Um, and okay, I think that is, that will be it for today. 
Um, you have um, the email for, for Jan and everyone who received an invitation to this event. You have my email. Again, my name is Freddie Perez. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to, to email them to me. Um, I appreciate everyone who was able to attend today's webinar. And I, you know, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Have a day. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye.